Well, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to welcome you all during this 10-day retreat. And as usual, let us begin with the mantra of the universe of its purity, Om Nam, seven times. Om Nam Om Nam Om Nam Thank you very much. Let me kindly inform everybody that this is a short Dharma talk. That's why we do not have introductory. You can ask your questions in your own language and I'll answer uh, in your own language. And tomorrow, uh, Tamir Masas, Dharma Master and Okesunin Dharma Master will answer your questions as well at the same time. Okay, so two short talks from three people in three days. That's a big luxury. The moment you step into this temple, there's something very clear going on, although the means that we use may seem a little bit different from what you are used to. Nothing else is happening that returning to our true nature. Nothing more, nothing less. And if you feel comfortable, if you feel emancipated, if you feel that this practice is working, then it's for that reason alone that we are returning to something we already are, but we haven't really experienced it yet, or not yet fully experienced it. What is our true nature? What are we as human beings? Just a body, a mind, something sentient? All these questions form something very simple we call Zen practice. And then as we gain insight into what we are, we become more complete. And this completeness gives you the stability, the centeredness, the healthy self-confidence to deal with life. It always amazes me when I go back and forth between Korea and the West, that this tradition was behind monastery doors for more than 1,500 years. And then the 20th century opened it up and we, lay people, as you are now, and I was 25 years ago, we started to be interested in this. And we wanted to know what's behind those monastery doors because we wanted to know what's behind the doors of our own heart. So we started to practice. No one really realized, except the fully accomplished masters, what we are getting into. Something that was geared for total renunciation, completely letting go of lay life, being just a monk or a nun and practicing this for hundreds of years suddenly gets out, suddenly reaches the West and suddenly it has to answer your questions. And it took a lot of adaptation and it's far from over that this tradition would fully be capable of just making life better, bringing about a healthier society, bringing about a more enlightened consciousness, whether it's an individual, a couple, a family, or a group. This kind of evolution is our job, both inside and outside. And this practice that we are doing here is supposed to help that. So if you take it really into your heart and you're doing it very sincerely, then that's what it does. It helps you. It helps your family. It helps your group, your country. And it does help all beings eventually. If you have any questions, concerning this practice, why we are doing it, what we are doing exactly, this is the time to ask. I have a question about the chanting. So I understand it's part of the tradition, but I can understand the lyrics, the meaning, and it's hard for me to like be there or even follow the chant. 
because it's take like a big part of the retreat or at least like two hours. How can I connect to the chanting and why why we're doing that? What is the meaning of falafel? It's a food. Yeah, correct. What is the meaning of hummus? How do you attain falafel and hummus? Hummus, it's part of falafel. It doesn't help you. You just read the menu, but you cannot eat the menu. If you want to attain falafel, you have to go to your local restaurant, your yeah. favorite. Also, if you want to attain hummus, then you have to go to a very good store, many kinds of hummus. I like a little spicy. And get that. Then we experience food. We eat it. Chanting, interestingly, is the same. Your intellect is hungry, so it wants to know the meaning. Mm -hmm. So we want to know the menu. But when we eat, it's just the experience of the food itself that nourishes us, nothing else. So the experience of chanting is what really nourishes us, not the intellectual meaning. The intellectual meaning is necessary. Your intellect wants to be satisfied. So we have it as a translation inside our chanting book. You can study that in the break time. Mm -hmm. And as you get into the energy of the chanting, that becomes an experience for you. Okay. Light, as you see it. Is it a wave or a particle? You don't know? Even physicists sometimes argue what's what in light, whether they see it as a particle or as a wave. But for the photons, it doesn't matter. They don't know it. They just do their jobs. So the same way with chanting, it clears your mind. It, in fact, does three important jobs. One, it takes away the noise of the mind. Mm -hmm. Second, it protects your own mind against its own harmful reactions. Fear, anger, greed, hatred, all these things that we react with to the outside world, to other people to our situation, to our relationships. And these reactions harm us and harm others. And the third important factor of a mantra is that it has meaning. It does have meaning. It's good to know that meaning. But when we chant, we don't think about it. And without thinking, that meaning comes to the top of our spiritual hierarchy. So three important functions of the mantra, clears the mind, protects the mind, and structures the mind correctly, mm -hmm. okay? That's why we chant. For all my life, since I was born, my parents taught me how to talk. And, uh, and since then, I'm always talking to meet people, to say smart things, to let everybody know that I'm smart. And now we are coming here, and you are asking me to keep quiet. What's so good in being quiet? Great. You already understand. You come here because talking takes so much energy and so much thinking and so many emotions. Yeah, we learn all these capabilities from our parents. But usually when our parents say, quiet, it's like a disciplinary action. And we don't like it. It means that they don't want to listen to us because we are a little bit naughty, tiresome, we annoy them, etc. There's an old saying, children should be seen and not heard. You know, this is very old fashioned. In fact, it's not good psychologically. Staying silent here means that we relate to each other correctly. We save our energy. We turn our attention inwards. And we discover something which is impossible if we were talking or thinking or always expressing ourselves. If you always have waves on a lake, it cannot reflect what's above the water clearly. So when you're quiet and let others be quiet, then soon your mind's mirror becomes more even. And if you practice a long time, then this mirror can become very precise, very meticulous. When your mind is really not moving, it perceives any kind of movement. If it's really still, even the smallest movement, either inside or outside, in another human or an animal, a machine or nature, this clarity doesn't come easy. 
You can get a bathroom mirror very cheap in the store. But if you want a mirror that is helping you seeing the most remote galaxies, that's very expensive and it takes two, three years to make just a part of it. So to work on the mind, to have it really cleared up, solidified, i.e. you have a center and you have some clarity, it takes work. And that's why we are here. And the development is impossible without testing and challenges. That's why we have interviews. It challenges you, trains you, teaches you, sometimes makes you laugh or cry. It's something that you are doing as a reaction to this teaching, which is just like clear water. Thank you. You're welcome. My question is, like all afternoon and most of the time today, I tried to keep awake during the meditation and I couldn't help it to fall asleep. Good start. Lin Chi, who became Zen master later, was doing the same thing for four years. Way to go. Okay, hello. <laughs> Just try. Try to stay awake. The mind has many clouds. Some clouds are from the food we eat, or anything we consume, or what we drink. Some other clouds are from our thoughts, our emotions, our attachments. And the moment you try to stay awake, that's when you realize, hey, wow, I'm carrying all this. I have to wake up. So if you like staying awake, come for our intensive week. <laughs> During our three-month retreat, the very middle, the seventh week, is what we call intensive week, only three hours of sleep for five nights. And on the sixth night, no sleep at all, at least not lying down. So way to go. Okay. Try to stay awake more and more. And that means you will sleep better when you sleep. For example, I was sitting and falling asleep. I lay, I cannot sleep. I sit, I sleep. It will change, I promise you. <laughs> You try to really be awake <laughs> during sitting, you'll sleep better at night or resting time. Thank you. Would you kindly explain what we see in the picture behind the statue of the Buddha? It's a, a very old comic book page. <laughs> it looks like it. What you see behind the altar in Korean, it's called Hubul Tenkwa, that's the name of the picture itself, is the Buddha's main disciples, 16 people, and some protective deities around them. In general, the altar picture is not just an illustration or a work of art. It's a gateway to another realm. And when we practice correctly, then what we see with our senses and what is beyond our senses, they connect. And that's why there are these signposts or indications what is beyond for us. They are. That's why on the side we have the protective deities. It's a realm we cannot see with the naked eye, but some sensitive people and clear people, they can perceive with their minds. If you look at the compass of Zen, the theory of mind only and karma, you can see all the 10 directions. Humans and animals, we can see them, hear them with our normal senses. Below that, demons and hell realm. Above that, demigods and gods is the six realms of existence. Now, I would like you to take it with a pinch of salt. I'm not trying to sell you this, okay? You don't have to believe this. Think about it as radio frequencies. Some receivers have the capability of tuning in to all the frequencies. Some of them are more limited and they can only see just with their eyes and hear with their ears. Zen does not discard the sensory realm. It extends the mind into the transcendental and doesn't destroy the everyday capabilities. It's very important. Above the six realms of existence, which are all subject to birth and death, impermanence, interdependence, and in imperfection, there's an interesting threshold. And above that threshold are the Buddhas and his disciples. It's called 
the threshold of life and death. So when we say attain enlightenment and become free from life and death, it's not a religious promise, okay? It's a trajectory that you can take if your boosters are strong enough and your navigation is clear enough. Above this threshold is the realm of the Pratyeka Buddhas, the Shravakas, the Bodhisattvas and the Buddhas. Pratyeka Buddhas are those beings who attain the enlightenment out of their own effort. Shravakas are the listeners who can listen very well. Bodhisattvas are enlightened beings who still return to earth to help other sentient beings. And Buddhas are the fully enlightened ones who do not incarnate anymore. Together, these are the ten directions, okay? So when we recite the offering text, we offer this food to the Buddhas of the ten directions, to all wise people and sages, etc. Then each one of these realms have enlightened beings, either born there and attaining there or just visiting there. So where are you in the ten realms? Do you see yourself somewhere? That's your starting point. Above the threshold of life and death, it's not four distinct layers, okay? It's like the four slices of the same cake. Because you cannot attain enlightenment without making your own effort. You cannot perceive the teaching without listening. You cannot resolve your personal karma without helping others. And if you don't attain full enlightenment, you are still short. You're not complete. The other six realms, if you look, you can really see them, even in the human body. Some people live a hellish life. Some people have a very good situation. Some people are very noble. Some are inhumane. And of course, there is a transcendental experience that opens up everything, okay? That's why we also practice to take away our clouds of ignorance, illusions, false identifications, and then these frequencies open up. The question is, why do we have to practice so much for it? Why do we have to make so much effort for it? And the answer is, if we didn't become strong enough, we couldn't endure the experience. If someone somehow just opened up your mind to it and we were too weak to endure it, it would do more harm than good. Okay? And that's why if these realms don't open up and you just cleared up your own human realm and your pet's animal realm, it's enough. It's no problem. Wherever you are, whichever body you take, stay clear. It said in the chant book, that when you chant and you perceive your own voice, I may be paraphrasing, uh, you're actually perceiving the universe. What does that mean? Come with me to this mantra called Om. One, two, three. Om. That's it. So when you really chant 100%, it takes away your dualistic thinking then you and this world can become one. The wall of the ego does not exist inherently. If we stop making it, it doesn't work. It actually falls apart. You don't fall apart. Your ego falls apart. Okay? When we chant, we do this in a professional way. Your personality has its own integrity. But you take away the clouds of ignorance and anger and greed and all these things, okay? The absolute views, the hardened illusions, the false identities, okay? That you think you are, you want to be, but you're not. So that's how you become one with the universe. So just chant. If you don't perceive your voice, it means it's too soft, okay? If you don't perceive other people's voice, that means you're too loud. <laughs> Keep up the good chant. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. You said the other day you come to the temple to peel your karma. So what is peeling my karma, I ask myself. What did you do for work period this morning? Kitchen? Yeah. Did you peel any vegetables or fruits in the kitchen? 
No, I peel the dirt out of the dishes. Correct. Even better. Same job. Except it goes on inside. With your chisel of awareness, you peel off the dirt of your own ignorant views, of your own attachments. And then you become clear. When we peel something outside, you know, like veggies or fruits, it's very clear what is unnecessary and what is necessary. Inside the mind, it's not so clear. Our karma can be very complex. So let the mind cleanse itself. Keep your mantra. Don't try to clean thinking with thinking. Don't try to peel off emotions with emotions. Because you cannot put out fire with gasoline. So you have the cool water of awareness. Wash all the dirt away. That's all you need. So stay in the moment. Stay clear. Keep your practice. And let all that appears disappear. That's what you need to do. Very simple. It seems effortless. It's the greatest effort to be effortless. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I was wondering, you know, because I'm new to these meditations. Lucky you. <laughs> Lucky. Imagine yourself in 30 years. Possible. <laughs> Go ahead. I was wondering if you could explain the correct technique for the meditation where you chant in your head, but focus on the... In the, in the Tantian, sure. Yeah. We focus on the Tantian because experience shows that this is the spot about an inch beneath your belly button and inside, of course, where your energy and your mind are one. It's not differentiated into various functions like emotions, speech, thinking, sensory perceptions. So we call this mental differentiation. We need that. That's what makes us human. But if we are attached to that, we get tired very easily, we get exhausted, we make mistakes, we have all these illusions that we grab as reality. Illusions as illusions, no problem. But our mistake is that we take illusions for reality. That's the problem. Beneath that is physical differentiation. That's how babies appear. And of course, you can make your tribe a bigger tribe, but sometimes it's good to refrain from that from time to time. And when you practice with tanti and focus, then this one mind, one body stays. You can become very clear if you focus on the tantian. We do not consciously reprogram the upper chakras for good reasons. You could hear me say earlier that thinking cannot fix thinking. It goes counter to logic. The West has tried to fix thinking with thinking for hundreds of years. Look at the mess we are in. Emotions with emotions. We needed 60 years of psychology to actually get out of there, okay? And without meditation, even that doesn't really work. So detachment doesn't mean this cold, heartless state of existence. Detachment means you get out of the car and let the mechanics fix your car. So you get out of the upper centers and you let your own clear energy and clear insight fix your karma, okay? We call that the self-cleansing capability of the mind. In Zen terms, Buddha nature, or the capability to get enlightenment. For that, we keep the form. So that we would be at a higher energy level, and the mind would start this process of self-cleansing by itself. Because your thinking cannot clear your thinking. There's just more of it. Emotions, the same. So to give you an idea how the process works, if your car got really muddy on this road, on the way to the temple, because you came in on a rainy day, you have a bunch of ways to clean that up. One is that you take a bucket of water and a sponge and you start to scrub it off, all right? But if you have the high pressure water pump and two atmospheres, you know, coming straight out of the gun, your water gun, then very quickly, seemingly effortless, okay? The whole thing gets cleaned up in five minutes. All the dirt off the car. That's the difference. So, I was also, sorry. I was and also... That's why we practice the Tantian because that's where this high energy can appear. So, is the sole focus on the Tantian or is it important to put your focus there but then also keep a chant in your head or just keep the chant also here? 
It goes, of course, wherever it has to go. But uh, keep everything in the Tantian. Otherwise, there's a traffic jam up here. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I would like to ask about the power of the great Dharani. I came to you. <laughs> you see, already silent. How good is that? Yeah. I came to you with a uh, challenge in a relationship, and you told me to chant and chant the great Dharani. And I, I did like, that. Yeah. Did you do that? I did, not fully in the beginning, but you I came in. You don't believe it 100%. I don't believe till I got something. And then I got something and I start to believe. And then you believed it? Now I believe it. Fantastic. Then what's your question? If you have no doubt. What's the, what's the power? What is, what's behind the I have the no idea. I tell you my first experience <laughs> with the great Dharani is like the falafel and the hummus. You eat it, you love it, you want more. That's it. Only that? Not enough? Not enough. The dog runs after the great Dharani. So... <laughs> 1990, September, my first time in this great Zen tradition, based on a recommendation by a friend, I was really asking burning, sorrowful, deep questions. I didn't get any real answers. So I go up there to this small meditation group, five, six people, already two of them Dharma teachers with these long robes, etc., they didn't even ask me my name. It wasn't important for them. They didn't ask why I went there. I asked, okay, can I help installing the room? Because they were carrying mats and cushions inside a small apartment. Of course. Okay. Then they put down chanting books. They showed me a seat. And we started to chant in a totally unintelligible language. Korean, And we... Chanted the hearts to train Hungarian. I didn't understand a single word of it. I mean, I understood some words, but not their connection, and least of all the overall meaning. And then came the great Dharani as the last chant of the day. And suddenly I went totally relaxed. And as if some oil inside was just totally cleaning me and healing the wounds, self-inflicted wounds. Only later I understood that this is the great compassion, Dharani, okay? I felt the effect first. Then we talked about it. And for 13 years, I didn't even know the translation. In Malaysia, 2003 or four ish I got to a Chinese temple where in the same booklet they had the Sanskrit, the English, and the Chinese characters of the great Dharani. It was a fantastic day of my life. Experience came first. Meaning next, and the function never changed, never. It always stays the same. Even after a hundred day retreat with more than six hours per day, net great Dharani chanting fast, it tastes the same. It does the same job. Nobody knows why. There is no ultimate why. It just does it. So just chant it. It melts everything. It changes karma because it changes the mind. Your mind creates your karma. You change your mind, you create different karma. I want to ask a serious question. You will get a serious response. <laughs> you know, we are uh, making Botox, so the face will be not wrinkled. You Smooth. are using Botox? Me, me okay. a little bit, but... <laughs> But a lot of people are making a Because you a said we. Oui. I don't we really see also, myself I, yeah. before the mirror applying it to my own face. So I'm asking how come your face, Duke Sonim, Tamir Masas, Master Sun Sang, they are all like this. It's because you are not worried because you are meditate, meditating a lot. This is the secret. Tell me the secret. <laughs> the secret is Zen Botox, okay? <laughs> Don't know. Lots of thinking, very many wrinkles. Little thinking, little wrinkles. No thinking, no wrinkles. <laughs> That's Zen Botox. Only Donno. 
I want to ask, why is there a statue of the Buddha if it is only form and we are seeking our true nature, which is something completely spiritual? Why do I need the statue? You know that for Jews it's it's even greater problem because we are supposed not to have any form of anything that represent if you take away the book that tells you that then what then i see something in gold that much better looks now we take away the other hindrance when you eat do you use fork and knife and yes. place you do right yeah why use that because you know the food goes into your mouth and into the stomach then it loses its form why use fork and knife and plate well it helps me it helps us in what way? Why do I need it in gold, for example? It's like tempting me. Tempting you? You work for a bank? Not so what? much? So temptation is going away. Very good. So three important functions. One is he's the founder. He was the first in our historical era who went all the way. When we bow, we don't bow to a statue. We bow to Shakyamuni Buddha himself from a distance of 2,560 something years. So first, we express our appreciation. Without that, without his effort and all the subsequent patriarchs, monks, nuns, lay people, we wouldn't be sitting here practicing Zen. Next, it's a reminder that a human being can get enlightenment. Not just him, all of us. So when you bow to the Buddha, again, it's not some fiberglass idea, we bow to everybody's Buddha nature, including yours. And that's mutual respect towards one another. Zen Master Sung San said, if somebody cannot bow, cannot practice Zen. And finally, the third important function is that when you bow, and you even prostrate yourself, then your mind is actually much lower and you raise the Buddha above you, higher. So that helps your internal transformation Then instead of your small self, your great true nature represented by the Buddha is more important. It really helps this internal cleansing and this internal transformation. So that's why we need help. Everyone does. In one way or another. At home, if you don't want a Buddha statue, don't use it. Here, we use it. It's a very clear standard, and uh, I'm glad that everyone can adopt this culture. Thank you. You're welcome. The phrase original, we hear that a lot in concept like original thoughts, original idea, original product, right? But can we have original life? Yes, we can. Original light is your mind light. It does not depend on photons I said or life, senses. life, not light. Original life. Original life? Yeah. Can we have original life? Yeah. If you feel it's genuine, it's your life, then for you it's original. It is not based on something someone else. Okay? You're not a copy of your father's and mother's <laughs> ideas. So original life means you are living your own life. You follow your own path. How can you stay from uh, ego if you want, if you pursue that original life? Can you stay away from ego? Yes, you can, because you don't live that life just for yourself. You live that for all beings. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, my question is about the meditation on the third one. What is it? Excuse no, me, I mean, what is it? The question we ask ourselves. Yes. It's what is it? Qu'est-ce que c'est? Yes. Yes, that's the question. Okay. And you direct it inwards. That's, yes. I, mean, I understand that. So we're just repeating or feeling what it is. You repeat it at every in breath, very gently. That's what, As if okay. you were putting a small stone on a big stone. The, I, I experience different way and the nice one slowly. And, during the in, okay. and it's just that, because... For the first six months or so. Okay. Then, something changes automatically. It becomes so ingrained that you can lose the words of the question, but the question itself remains there. 
I give you a metaphor. When you're in a taxi or someone drives for you, you can always say, please turn left, turn right, go straight, and then go straight, go straight, go straight. Then you don't have to say anything, just point. Some drivers don't like it, so be careful. But the mind likes it. Because when you do not have to ask the question, but the question is there, then it's in a completely clear autopilot. You feel the question, but you don't have to say the question. And then you can practice like that. We call that the question without words or the original question because it does not have name and form in it. Remember, this does not have originally name and form. We create forms, we create names, we create teaching in order for our minds to get there, okay? But originally, the question has no words, no speech. And sometimes concentrate on the Dantian? Yes, very important. And no, that's another school. This is the crown chakra, we don't deal with that. I mean, to suspend the top head, no? It's a technique to, st to sit straight, yes. okay? But, but you don't have to think about it, you don't have to visualize it. Once you see straight, forget it. Just focus on the Tantian. Okay. That's all. Yeah. Okay? Yes. Thank Wonderful. You. So I want to thank you all very sincerely that you traveled the long distance and you make a great effort to come here, that we could all practice together, attain clear mind, compassionate heart, and non-dualistic wisdom so that we could liberate all beings from suffering. Thank you very much.